In this episode we're going to explain what digital to analog converters are, or DACs or DAX for short, what they do and how we can use them. Cue the intro. DAC or digital to analog converter is basically the opposite of an ADC or analog to digital converter. Most microcontrollers have ADCs, such as this EP32, ESP32, sorry. Certainly the main popular multi purpose ones that hobbyists use have ADCs, including the Arduinos. ADCs are designed to read a voltage applied to their pin and convert it to a numerical value that you can then access and use in your code. Digital to analog converter DAX allow you to set a numerical value in your processor and they will output a voltage proportional to this on one of their pins. Again, that voltage will range between zero volts and the voltage reference. Typically, this again is the VCC voltage. Uh, the maximum numerical value you can set depends on the hardware and for this ESP32 uh, I've got here, it uses eight bits. So any number between zero and 255 can be set for this ESP32, and that will result in a voltage between, well, you think actually it's slightly different, between 0 and 3.3 volts, in theory. In reality, the change can be a little bit, uh, the, sorry, the range can be a little bit different uh, than that, but for now, we'll keep it simple and say it's between 0 and 3.3. It's actually a little bit above 0 and a little bit less than 3.3. So I'll set the value of in code to 0, would give 0 volts on the DAC output pin, uh, 127 will give approximately 1.65, because that's half of 3.2. And 255 will give the full maximum of 3.3 volts on the actual output pin for that DAC. On this ESP32, it has two DACs. One's on GPIO25, one's on GPIO26. So what can we do with the DAC? Well, I'll just put this down, it's getting quite heavy there. <laughs> so what can we do with the DAC? Well, we can change the voltage. So if we can change the voltage, sorry, then we can change the energy to some device that's connected to that. Uh, whether it's making something shine brighter or move faster or get hotter, etc. But in fairness, PWM or pulse wave modulation, if you're not sure about that, have a quick Google of it, can do a pretty good job of sort of changing the brightness of something or the speed in most situations. Although with lighting, a DAC will produce no high frequency flicker in the light. And sometimes high frequency Flicker, because basically pulse width modulation is switch that LED on, whatever it might be, really fast to make it dimmer or brighter or whatever. And sometimes people who have issue with light sensitive epilepsy, that can be a problem for them. But by far the most common use of DACs is to produce sound. I just realised we've lost our signal on there. That's probably because something's just popped out somewhere. And it was actually the entire microcontroller that pops out. Um, so yeah, so we, basically one of the most common uses of DACs is to produce sound, to convert digital sound into sound that we can hear. So you will have several DACs in your house now, uh, it's more in time, as more sound will, is now encoded digitally from the video that you're watching on YouTube right now, for, from me, to digital radio, or DAB radio it's called in the UK. They all need these numbers that represent the original sound converting to an electrical voltage of varying intensity and sending that to a loudspeaker of some sort. So that's also what we're going to concentrate on our use of the DSC for. In fact, I've got a volume control here which I'll talk about later, but if you want, this is actually um, producing this wave that we can see on screen. So if I just turn that up, you'll hear, be able to hear the sound that's producing. Yeah, and that can get really annoying. So, how could we produce a sound wave? So, let's have a look at one. I'm going to get, uh, just cut the video here, I'm going to get a piece of paper and just go over some of the basics. So, how could we produce a sound wave? Let's have a look at one. So, we'll do an axis on here. So, let's just visualise it and we'll draw a nice sort of sine wave like that. And we'll say that, um, the maximum value up here is say 16 
my pen's running out and that's zero. In fact we'll make that, we won't have negative values, we'll start at zero at the bottom. I know I've done like the middle of the axes there, but we've got zero at the bottom, eight there, 16 there. So obviously that would be about 12 and that would be about four. So these are, so this is the change in voltage. What we're gonna do is do what a DAC does. So let's put some intervals on, put one there, there. Roughly the same distance apart. This should be exactly the same distance apart, but obviously I'm freestyling it a little. And we'll do exactly what an ADC does. So when you've got an analogy digital converter, say you've got a microphone or whatever it might be, an ADC will sample over time. So this is our time scale, whatever that unit, I'll just put a U, is, seconds, microseconds, whatever it might be. Uh, this is representing voltage, but we're going to actually represent the voltage just by these numbers. So the ADC, the analogy digital converter, will look at this time interval. So time interval, we'll take a reading. Or we'll take a reading here at this time interval. That's the first one. And that will be a reading of 8 there. And then this next time interval would be, let's say that's near enough to 12. The next time interval would be probably 13 or 14 ish, I'll say 13. And then the next interval we've come to will again be 8. And then we can come down to here for this interval. And which would be, well, we're going a bit below the, the minimum. We're going to say that's zero, so I've just drawn it a little bit badly there. So that's say zero, etc. And you go along sampling the wave at these intervals and looking at what the, the numerical value of the voltage is from the analogous converter. So we've got a collection of numbers from 8, 12, 13, 8, and back to zero. So if you want to replay this sound, we will send these numbers back through a DAC, which convert them back to the analog signal. So let's have a look what that would look like. I'll get both of these in shot in a minute, so we'll just draw the scales again. And it was 16, 12, 8, 4 and 0 with a very bad pen. And roughly try and judge the same interval points again. And our numbers... If you remember on here, we're 8, 12, 13, 8, and 0. That's all we've got the sampling for now. So we'll just write them at the top so I can remember them. So 8, 12, 13, 8, and 0. And we'll replot them. So time interval, 0, it was an 8. So there's my first point point. Uh, the next time interval, it was 12. So there's my next plot point. And the next, it was 13. It was, that's about there. And the next one was eight and the next one was about zero and we'll just join them up with straight lines like that and if we just compare that to the original you can see i'm obviously got a slightly different scaling issues here that's my bad drawing but you can see it's approximately that same waveform there but a little bit more rougher you can imagine if we sampled more often so if we were to sample twice as often, we'd get more data points and that would start to smooth out. If we had a bigger resolution here, so we had more data points, instead of going just up to 16 in little chunks of like that, so 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, well, in fact, it's not even that, so 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. If we were to increase the resolution there, say go to 255, we'd have a lot more precision to produce dots along there as well. So you get something that looked a lot like this. So it would give a much more accurate representation of the waveform. And that's what decides the quality of a digital sound sample. Ignoring any elect analog electronics involved in the sound capture, such as the mic and the speaker and various passive components, etc. It's the range we have to represent the voltage and the number of samples we take per second. So typically old-fashioned CDs, uh, CD quality use 16 bits for the amplitude resolution, which gives a value from 0 to 65,535, or 65,536 different sample points for the amplitude of the voltage, and around 44,000 samples 
taking every second. And that's for CD quality, which is actually really good quality. If we go much beyond that, most people cannot tell any difference in quality. Just because of our biology, we'll not permit it. We're not that good at taking any more finesse out of a, uh, a sound. And of course, there is a payoff with quality. The higher the quality and the more samples per second, or the more range of values stored at amplitude, then the more memory we require to store the same sample. Instead of just requiring these, well, for up to 16, it will be 4 bits. If we go to 255, that's 8 bits. So we've doubled the memory we need there. The more samples we do per second, we have to store those. So we double it there, or triple it, or quadruple it, depending on how many samples per second we want to do. Uh, so that's the payoff. And also, the harder our processor has to work in getting that data to the DAC in time, to the DAC in time. As we're using embedded MCUs, then speed and memory are not two things we tend to have in an abundance. So some compromises will have to be made. The SP32 has, for example, an 8-bit range for the amplitude of the voltage. But that is enough, that is surprisingly enough, and it will give surprisingly good sound reproduction, especially for applications where, where we will tend to use it. It also has a generous amount of memory with around about 1000k being the typical amount with these systems, with these dev boards, and some systems have an even more. We can also add in more memory in the form of SD cards. Uh, for the Arduino, digital sign will be a little bit more challenging because it's more restrictive memory, quiet memory, and etc., and speed, uh, but it's not impossible. So now we'll have a quick look at the actual circuit diagram that uh, we're going to use. So let's look at my setup, along with the circuit diagram for it. I have a ESP32, uh, as has two DACs as standard. I have an audio amplifier that connects to a speaker. Now you may wonder why I don't connect the speaker directly to the ESP32. Well, it's because the impedance of the speaker, its resistance is, let's just bring the speaker into shot a little bit there. Might help. Pop that there. Oh, I don't know whether that's helping, but there, you can see I've got a speaker and it's connected by these two wires. Uh, the impedance of the speaker, its resistance is quite low. Typically they're around 4, 8 or 16 ohms, I think this is 4 ohms. Uh, this would allow a large current to flow through the ESP32 and the GPIO pins are not capable of handling that kind of current and you're just going to break your MCU if you connect a speaker directly to them. So for the ESP32, the output of the DAC of DAC1, there's two digital to analog converters as I said, so we'll call this DAC1, goes to GPIO pin 25, which is that one just there. I then send this output to a voltage, uh, sorry, I then send this output voltage to a voltage divider, which is these two resistors here, that reduces that range, remember the range will be between 0 and 3.2 by a factor of 10, so basically about a 10k and a 1k resistor out in the voltage divider. This is because the spec sheet for the audio amplifier states that the maximum voltage permitted to the inputs, and the inputs are here, left input, right input. The maximum input permitted on the input is 0 0.3 volts. But the SP32 will try and output a voltage between 0 and 3.3 volts on its DAC. So if we reduce this divider, sorry, if we reduce this um, to divide the voltage by 10, then we've got the correct range. Well, near enough anyway, so between 0 and about 3.1 volts it'll end up being near enough to the actual audio amp. Now the audio amp, by the way, is based on the, you can't see on here, but on the PAM8403 audio amp chip, and it's very widely available on these little modules like this for about half the price of a chocolate bar delivered from abroad, China, wherever you might get it from, that's usually the place. And they will drive speakers as low as 4 ohms if you don't take the voltage much above 5 volts. But looking at the circuit, we still don't send this reduced output, so we've reduced it here. So this wire does not go into this audio amp, if you've noticed. So we still don't sound, sound, still not send this uh, straight to the audio amp. We could do that, and it would be fine, but the sound will be at full volume from that speaker all the time, and that will be, um, yeah, just a little bit annoying. So we send the reduced signal to a potentiometer, which is basically another voltage divider, so we can reduce or increase the voltage um, to the audio amp as we turn it one way or the other, which I could do now, it's all wired up and working. As I say, it is very annoying. Uh, and thus reducing or increasing the amplitude from the speaker. The output from this potentiometer is then sent, so the output's coming here, going out here, is then sent to the audio amp 
on the right side. We could have put it on the left if you wanted to drive the speaker. We put it on the right, so this is the output for the right, this is the output for the left. So we've connected the wires of speaker to the right because we've plugged it into the right. If I put it onto the L side for the left, I would have put these two wires on this side. So we'll go back now and have a look at some code to create a signal. So let's look at some code to create a signal. Go to extronical.com and basics, audio, and DAX on ESP32. I will be doing uh, a similar episode for the Arduino as well in the very near future. Uh, but click on that for now. And you get a write-up of basically what's uh, in this video. Plus there'll be some sample code down here that you can use for testing if you build this kit. So that's where you need to go to get the code I'm about to show you. So let's go to the first example, which is basically... Oh, I've just launched the Arduino software again, which is rather annoying. Uh, my phone's going off at the same time. So <laughs> moving on. I open up uh, one of the first examples I have called Sawtooth Wave 1. It's not the one you're seeing on the screen at the moment. I'm just going to upload this new one. You see, it's an extremely simple piece of code. Um, nothing in the setup and just one loop of two lines uh, in the actual main code. So we're just compiling and uploading that. So while it's just finishing off, oh, it's taking it's taken a long time to compile for some reason. All it does is it increases the value from 0 to 255. So that's what that's doing there. I put it to the, uh, to the DAC. Uh, so it's increasing the voltage from the minimum to the maximum. Uh, and it then very quickly after it gets that maximum, 255, it goes right back to zero and starts it all over again, which sort of gives you a sort of classic sawtooth shape. And the speed of which we can, uh, the speed at which we send these values to the DAC determines the frequency or the pitch of the sound that we'll hear. Um, so that hopefully, yep, is just going up, just uploading now. I'm going to see the difference between that and the one that was just on the screen a second ago. So what we've got here. I won't just zoom in just yet, but we've got the uh, value going from 0 to 55 up. And then very quickly, because we just repeat the, roof, the loop, it starts at 0 again. So if you, you probably can't see it on the screen. There's an extremely faint line there as it quickly goes back down and starts again. So usually on some of the old scopes, you get a bit of a glow there. We could also some of the settings so we can see this line a bit more prominent, but I'm not going to. So you've got a sort of zig, um, sort of sawtooth shape. I'll load up the second example, sawtooth two, which will, there is it, there it is. We'll just start that compiling. And if you look what this one does, um, it goes from zero to 256, just like that does, but then starts to come back, do it zero to 255, sorry and starts to come back down from that um, down to zero. So we should get a sort of nice pyramid effect on this oscilloscope, another sort of type. Uh, the DAC write, I haven't had to have any libraries for that. If you have installed the um, software to get the SP32 programmable from the Arduino IDE environment, I'll put a card up into the corner now, then you will actually just get that. It's just uh, standard. I've not had to include anything to use DAC right at all. And we're just uploading. So as it's going up and down, you should see a nice sort of triangular sawtooth pattern appear in a few seconds. There we go. So it all looks, I mean, it all looks very, very smooth, doesn't it, really? Um, I'll just put another demo on just now. So you've seen the sawtooth. I'm going to put on a sine wave. So the sine wave is a lovely little curve that goes along your screen. I'll just um, upload that one. So sine wave, there it is. Um, it looks a little bit more complicated, uh, I suppose it is. I'm not really going to much detail on it, but in the setup, basically, I'm calculating the values of sine for a full sort of 360 degrees of a circle. I don't have to go, I don't actually go, I do go full 360 degrees, but I do it in, um, first of all, computers love to work in radians. And secondly, our 8-bit DAC only wants to go up to 255. So I convert, basically, a circle to 255 local parts and convert them to radians, but again, you don't have to worry about that. That's all done the code there. And then all we do again in the loop is I put the value of sine for all the values that we can do. So I'll just upload that and we'll see a lovely little smooth curve on the screen. Okay, so it should come up in a minute. Well, in a minute, a few seconds, as it just reboots. There we go. And that looks lovely, doesn't it? It looks like a lovely smooth sine wave. However, as we explained on the paper earlier, each one of these going up is a discrete step of a voltage. It's not 
you know, it looks smooth because we've got basically 255 different values in a space this big. So they're quite close together and we get a nice smooth effect. In addition, we're only outputting along this scale uh, at a predetermined uh, speed, depending on the microprocessor and how quickly it can update its DAC. So if we just zoom in a little bit, I won't bother doing the camera and I think we'll still get this on screen. So if we just zoom in, let's bring that down. So zooming on the vertical position to start with, you can already see those jumps that are happening in voltage. I will just bring that out a bit as well. Bring that across here. Bring that down a bit. So this is the bottom of a wave. You can see the discrete voltage jumps that it's doing. And in fact, if we were to, I mean, we can see the maximum minimum for the entire wave there. But if we were to actually um, calculate this, we'd see that it was probably very near to the original calculation we did for millivolts. Slightly different, as I said, because we were presuming 0 to 3.3 volts. It's not actually that. But yeah, you can see the discrete steps going down and also there's discrete chunks going across. But obviously, um, when it's um, at normal sort of resolution, it looks fine. So just bring that back in. Nice big wave. And even at that resolution, it looks really, really smooth. Because 255 values, it's a reasonable resolution um, that we can actually use. So finally, we'll put on the, the last demo that we actually had as a background while I was talking. I just launched the Arduino software again. That's really not annoying. Um, so we've got the Sawtooth 3, I've called it. And basically, I'm just showing you here, Just we can really manipulate that wave with incredible finesse and make it do almost whatever we want. So I'll get that loaded. You can see that what I'm doing here, I'm sort of like going up to 256. Um, then I come back down to uh, zero, but then I go up to 75, but I only st I stop at 75, then I come back down to zero, and then I repeat the whole cycle again, and we'll get that waveform up that we saw at the beginning. Okay, so that's uh, going to come on and get the screen again in a second. Come on. There we go. Um, let's just hold to the trigger level. So let's get it up there so we get a bit of stability. Um, we'll just bring the horizontal... Um, <laughs> Helps you use the right control, Steve, in the right way. There we go. Looks nice and pretty on screen now. So yeah, that, we've just done that with code. We're um, ramping, we started here, and the code's ramping up to 255. It ramps right the way back down, then we just went up to 75, then down to 70, back down from 75 to zero, and then we repeat the process, and we get this wave. I should turn the volume up really of this, you know. Hear the tone there. Sound wave sounds still a bit different, because I... Obviously, it's been generated in a slightly different way. And if we want to talk to the frequency, um, we just play about that. We can't send it any faster than it's actually going because of the limits of the hardware, but we can jump up in different amounts of steps. If you look at the code, I'm jumping up in twos on my screen. I think on the actual website, it jumps up in ones. Um, so obviously, I've actually doubled the frequency from the original uh, that it actually was on the uh, website itself. So you may as well just turn that annoying buzz down. So you may say, what's the point? of this very simple tone yes we could make a sort of musical instrument sort of thing a sort of tune by changing the frequency and having beeps and boops and what have you but that's really no better than the default that we could do with a, a digital pin and using pwm uh, well for these simple demos obviously the most we can do is produce those simple tones by changing the frequency but by having such as i said a finesse or finite control over the amplitude of the waveform over time we can create much more complex wave patterns and therefore sounds and indeed full speech and music are, you know, as in music is in what a band is going to be playing, they're easily possible given enough um, microprocessor resources. In the next episode, we'll look at getting these demos to work on an Android, you know, using a DSC that is an add-on module. In the future, I'll introduce a library that allows you to play complex sounds easily with single commands such as laser zaps and explosions and pings and bells and whistles or whatever it might be. Uh, but until then, please give this video a thumbs up, a share, a subscribe. And if you've not already done so, doing the, sorry, if you subscribe, you've not already done so, because doing these things really, to these videos really helps them to be suggested by YouTube's algorithm to other viewers and helps grow this channel. And it really is a massive help. So until next time, thanks for watching. And bye for now.